Will Mike Yastrzemski have a bounce back season or will he continue to regress offensively? What does Joey Bart need to do to really cement himself as the primary catcher for the Giants? What does the Giants plan at shortstop behind Brandon Crawford, not just this year, but in future years where he's probably not going to be here? So we'll get to those questions and many others next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspic, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday. Well, actually, right now, three days a week until pitchers and catchers report in less than a month, believe it or not. Talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. And coming up on today's show, we've got some mailbag questions that I've been sitting on here for a couple of weeks, and we're just going to jump right in. Nolan says, does Mike Yastrzemski have a bounce back season, or does he continue to regress offensively? So good question. If you look at the last three years, okay, actually, let's look at the whole career here. Debuted in 2019. The first year under Farhan Zaidi, he was a minor trade acquisition, I think, prior to the season, and then spent the first several months or a couple months in the minors and then was called up and given a chance. And all he did was, I mean, he struggled at first, but then had a really hot end of the season and ended up, you know, 20% above average offensively, putting up 2.6 fan graphs, wins above replacement in just... 107 games about two is a is a solid kind of average player over the course of a full season so he's at 2.6 over the course of significantly less than a full season and then the next year for him is the short 2020 campaign and he goes into that year and gets MVP votes he looked like the MVP I'm doing air quotes for those of you not watching on YouTube I think now the the total lesson from 2020 is that A lot of weird stuff happened in 2020 because we're talking about a 60-game season. And Mike Yastrzemski's performance was kind of at the top of the list when we talk about what now looks like slightly fluky performance. So he had a 158 weighted runs created plus, meaning about 60% above average offensively. He hit 297. He had a 400 on base percentage, a 568 slugging. Again, put up 2.0 Fangraphs wins above replacement in just 54 games. I just said 2.0 is about an average season over a full season. And we're talking two in 54 games for Yastrzemski. So at that point, he looked like a blossoming star. But then 2021 was kind of major regression for Yaz, even though the team, this is one of those things where people say everything went right in 2021. Well, not Mike Yastrzemski's performance. He fell off significantly and was about league average offensively and about league average overall. Here we go. 2.3 fan graphs wins above replacement in 139 games. So that's more of average production. As I've been saying, his previous two years, he was around that number in much less work. And then he followed it up in 2022, being a tick below league average by weighted runs created. Plus, the last two years combined offensively, he's hit 219 with just a 308 on base percentage and 424 slugging. So the power continues to be solid. He hit 25 home runs in 2021, 17 in 2022. It's not bad. And then he plays a good uh, outfield defense. But the real story of Mike Yastrzemski, and this is why we're always saying platoon splits in a single season sample are not great to look at because let's let's do it. Let's look back at his single season platoon splits against left-handed pitching. So he's a left-handed hitter facing left-handed pitching in that first brief season in the majors in 2019. We're talking 89 plate appearances, very small sample. Uh, he, he hit 329 with a 382 on base and 561 slugging against lefties. And then in 2020, he hit 
284 with a robust 385 on base and 612 slugging against lefties. So that is part of a big part of what made him look like a star there was that he could really, it seemed that he could really ha- handle left handed pitching. But then if we look at the next two years for Yaz, in 2021, he hit 170 with a 254 on base and 259 slugging against lefties. And then last year, he hit 179, 250 on base, 325 slugging against lefties. So it's like the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. But if you combine it all together, he's been a little bit below league average against left-handed pitching. And so unfortunately, that, like getting back to your actual question, is kind of, I look at the whole body of work. So sometimes good, sometimes bad, but overall okay but not great against left-handed pitching and kind of a borderline platoon player someone who because of his defense you could kind of justify having him out there against lefties uh but let me just say the the numbers against right-handed pitching overall in his career now about 1300 plate appearances 334 on base 485 slugging so healthy numbers here about 20 percent above league average overall offensive production for Yaz against right-handed pitching. And so basically it's kind of a boring answer, but I kind of would project him to be what he's been in his career at this point, which is above average against righties, below average against lefties, but not by too much, hopefully. And then giving you good defense and, you know, probably going to play center this year. And so the defense is not as good in center as it is in right, but still average or maybe a little better than average in center field. And so I don't think he'll continue to regress. I think actually maybe he's due for some what we call positive regression, regression to his mean, and regression can go in the other direction too. So in his, I think he's going to have a better season offensively than he had last year, but I also just no longer think that he's a star player, but he clearly has that in him if he has a, you know, if the stars all align for him in a particular season, and especially if he just manages to have a good year against left-handed pitching, I think he could have a really good season, but overall, I'd expect him to be more of an average player, but maybe a tick better than average. And the defense makes him a, a solid player, even if the bat is what it has been the last couple of years. So anyway, that was a kind of long-winded way to answer the Mike Yastrzemski question, but it's relevant because he's going to be a big part of this team. And there's kind of the new Brandon Belt. I think there's a lot of people who have been critical of Yastrzemski, but He doesn't have to be a star to be a useful player, and that's what he is right now, in my opinion. So coming up in just a minute, another somewhat polarizing player is Joey Bart, and we're going to get into a couple questions about what Bart needs to do moving forward, so we'll get into it in just a minute. But before we do, this episode is brought to you by BetOnline. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis hands down. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football, college football, basketball, NFL playoffs. Hello, you can bet on the 49ers. Check out all the action there. We've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. A lot of off-season MLB odds stuff that we've been doing all off-season long. Coming up, we should have over-unders on win totals. That is always a fun thing, not just to get a good sense of where the quote-unquote betting industry thinks the Giants are, but also if there's an opportunity to make some bets, whether it's on the Giants or another team. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online is where the game starts. All right, as promised, more questions and answers. I want to discuss... Joey Bart will also will also get to the deep Giants pitching staff and what they plan to do there. Like we keep talking about, they might have seven starters. How are they going to roll with seven starters? What is the plan? But M-D-O-E-F-F, Madoff, says, uh, what is Joey Bart's future with the Giants? And what does he need to do this season to remain the number one option at catcher? Also, Where do you rank the starting rotation as it stands today? Oh, sneaking in a rotation question there. And B. Cummings says, what are the chances of Joey Bart gaining confidence this year and stepping up to dominate at the plate? So offensively, Bart had an interesting season because it started off, it started off promising in the sense that he suddenly was like really good at not chasing out of the strike zone. And so I think that that was a clear focus for him in the offseason and in you know spring training and all that 
these days guys you know they wear their vr goggles and they can practice like seeing pitches and making swing decisions like deciding should i swing at this pitch or not and kind of the modern philosophy of baseball and certainly on the giants is like swing if it's a pitch that you can hammer and if it's not a pitch that you can hammer we don't want you swinging at it which means the old mentality of like protect the strike zone and if you get to two strikes you have to expand your zone a little bit that is outdated and if you're like watching and thinking that you're going to be upset watching the Giants because that's like if Brandon Belt's style of hitting upset you, you're going to be I'm just trying to tell you that it's an intentional philosophy, whether you like it or not. I personally think it I mean, if you watch 2021 and how the Giants operated, that's how it's supposed to work and it leads to more walks and it also leads to more damage because you're just swinging at your ideal pitches and laying off kind of kind of fringe pitches, which leads to, you know, borderline pitches being not swung at, which leads to walks, etc. So for Bart, he showed that an improved ability in a big way to start the 2022 season. But then it became apparent to pitchers and to those of us watching that pitchers could just challenge him in the strike zone and there was too much swing and miss. And so it didn't really matter that he wasn't chasing because they could just challenge the strike zone and he wasn't getting to those pitches. And so contact became a big problem. Strikeout rate kind of stabilized at a ridiculously high number, like mid forties, 45% or so strikeout rate. And that's when he was demoted. So he gets demoted. He works on some things. He doesn't go straight to, uh, the miners. He worked at the hitting, you know, facilities in in Arizona, I think, and then eventually made his way to AAA. And suddenly, the Giants had a need. I forget exactly what led to him being being called back up. Was it Kurt Casale sustained some kind of injury? I think, and then Bart got called back up. And then once he was called back up, the big improvement was that the strikeout rate was down. Like if he can keep his strikeout rate under thirty percent. The question, you know, I think was asked in a couple different ways. What does he need to do to be a good hitter, basically? And to me, if he can strike out less than 30%, he really improves everything. But the the balance is, like, you you don't want to go back to your free swinging ways either. So you've got to, like, sustain your ability to not chase, but also improve your ability to make contact, especially contact on pitches in the zone, because ideally you're not chasing out of the zone very often. And sometimes it's not a bad thing to not make contact on a pitch out of the zone because you're not doing that damaging type of contact on pitches out of the zone. Hence why they don't want you swinging at it in the first place. So anyway, I mean, the average on balls in play for Bart, if he can just put it in play, he hasn't had a problem like getting hits on balls in play. And then also uh, getting to some power, he came into this year with zero major league home runs, even though he had about uh, 117 plate appearances, he hadn't hit a home run. So this year he got to 11 home runs in 291 plate appearances. So, and the overall offense, he still had a 90 weighted runs created plus, which means about 10% below league average offense. But for catchers, the league average is certainly lower than the league average hitter. And so for Bart, he did okay as an offensive catcher, but they're just not going to tolerate somebody striking out close to half the time uh, in their lineup. And so he has to stop striking out that much. But for him, it's been a hard thing to do to get the combination of not striking out, but also um, you know, making more contact, but also not continuing to not chase. So we saw it for a brief period where he it all kind of came together for him, but then towards the end of the year, he tailed back into those strikeout ways. And so there's also the whole defensive component, which is arguably most important for a catcher. And while improved, I still think that he has some issues defensively. And, you know, his first couple years in the league, specifically 2020, he looked overwhelmed, like behind the plate. He was dropping pitches that were in the zone. He was getting frustrated or the pitchers were getting frustrated with him, with his pitch calling. So just another year getting more comfortable. I'm skeptical, honestly, but you know, they've got, I think that it's important to try to continue to develop him. So I wouldn't expect stardom at this point, but if he can improve his defense, improve his framing, he's got a big arm, but you know, framing was a little bit of an issue and I'm not 
you know, there's been some hinting that maybe certain pitchers didn't love throwing to him. And so we'll see. He still has minor league options. And so the problem is the Giants aren't super deep at this position. But, like, he's just got to improve in a lot of areas. And and given that he's 26, given that he was a second overall pick, I would, you know, hope that he has the ability to improve. He showed improvement last year. And so hopefully just continued improvement, continuing to work on the things that he needs to work on. I'm not totally out on Joey Bart, but I do have some skepticism about his ability to do all these things that I'm saying are going to be necessary. But then if he doesn't, they don't have currently a lot of great options behind him. So we'll have to wait and find out. Next question comes from David. And also I'll tie in with Uh, the other question that said, how would you rank the starting rotation as it stands today? But David says, with six solid starters, are the Giants thinking of stacking starters such as Alex Cobb or Anthony DiSclefani with Alex Wood? Have one go four or five innings and the other finish? If so, could this be the plan for Harrison once he gets the call to conserve his innings? So we're actually going to answer that question in just a minute, all about the Giants starting rotation and also What is the plan at shortstop behind Brandon Crawford? So all of that in just a minute, but before we get into it. All right, as promised, we are going to discuss the starting rotation, how it ranks, and what is the plan with all these starting pitchers. I've said this before. I feel like I said I talked about this same thing last year, and it didn't really come to fruition in terms of piggybacking starters. So that's really kind of the term I would use to describe what David is talking about with six solid starters. So the starters they have, just for, you know, to refresh everyone's memory, they've got obviously Logan Webb, Alex Cobb, who I'm super high on after the year he had that was ravaged by bad defense behind him. I think if he had a good infield defense behind him, but they haven't changed the infield defense, so maybe that doesn't happen. Although again, positive regression. A lot of guys just had like fluky bad years, I would say all over the place defensively. But anyway, Webb, Cobb, Manaya, Stripling, Wood, Di Sclafani, and Junis. So I'm, I'm assuming you're not counting Junis there. And then Di Sclafani, he had season-ending ankle surgery early on last year, but my understanding is that they expect him to be a full go in spring training. Maybe not a full go. Maybe, you know, they're not going to push him probably to 200 innings. You mentioned conserving innings. I think that Di Sclafani is someone they'd want to do that for. But Anyway, like, what is the plan? I think currently, when you look at the bullpen, they'd probably have a guy or two in the bullpen. Like, they could also do what you're saying. And so I don't I don't know what the plan is. I do like the idea. I don't think four or five innings a piece. Typically, when you see these kind of piggybacking, I don't know, I guess if if both guys cruise that day, you could see one start and the other finish. Like, for example, I mean, I don't think Cobb is someone who deserves to have to be piggybacked like this. I think more likely you'd see it with like Alex Wood and Anthony DiSclefani because Alex Wood, he had his problems like in a major way going three times through the order. I could also see it with like Sean Manaya and Ross Stripling or Alex Wood and Anthony DiSclefani. I think going like four innings out of Wood and then three innings out of DiSclefani and then you're at the back of the game and if you have a kind of small lead, you go to your high end relievers. And if the game is out of hand one way or the other, you can let, you know, the second pitcher finish the game. Uh, So there's a lot of options. And I think it's not a bad thing at all to have that kind of depth. And there's injury histories with a lot of these guys. Like Wood has an injury history. He actually went on the IL with a shoulder impingement to finish out the year. And Cobb has had his share of injuries. And of course, Di Sclafani coming back from the injury. And so it it could work itself out in that a couple guys go on the injured list and then suddenly you're shorthanded. And definitely, though, when you say Harrison, I think that they'll, they're not just going to let him start throwing seven innings per start right away. They'll probably have him be one of these kind of four-inning guys initially to kind of protect his arm, not have him have too much of a workload in this season. He is 21 years old. So it's a good problem to have, but... It remains to be seen exactly how they're going to use these guys. I would expect, though, I mean, if you've got Di Scofani in the bullpen, he's not a one-inning guy, right? So he'll effectively probably be piggybacking. And Junis as well, right? He was a starter for a lot of last year. And if he's in the bullpen, he can certainly be a guy who piggybacks with Alex Wood or something. So 
yeah, I wouldn't be surprised by that at all. And in terms of how would I rank them, I don't know. I think they're they're certainly a top half rotation, maybe around 10th overall or something. For me, it could be better, especially if Harrison comes up and makes an impact, then you put them in top seven or something like that. It depends on who's healthy. And the potential is there for a lot of these guys, but also a lot of these guys have had bad years in their careers at times. So I think it's the top 10 rotation right now. And the depth is a real strength, and they've got some upside in Webb and Cobb, I think, and then Harrison as well. So last question coming from AJ, who says, assuming Correa signs with the Mets, you can see that this is an old question, uh, and I have been sitting on it for a while. What is the plan for shortstop after this season? And so, of course, Correa didn't sign with the Mets, but is signed with the Twins, so he's not a part of the Giants' future what is the plan at shortstop for after this season is a great question because Brandon Crawford is the last year of his deal. And if you look at, you know, the Giants minor league system, you've got guys like Marco Luciano, who we've been talking about potentially moving off of shortstop, especially when it looked like the Giants were getting Correa. But if you look at next year's free agent class, these last couple of free agent classes have been so deep with shortstop talent, but this upcoming one is not deep at all in shortstop talent. And so it's they're going to have to trade for someone. They're going to have to re-sign Crawford, which I it depends on how he performs in 2022. I I'm currently excuse me 2023 currently doubting that he has a season worthy of bringing him back for another year. But I wouldn't if he has a solid year. I wouldn't rule it out at all. They clearly like their you know core players and bringing back their veteran guys and could be like a transitional year where you have Crawford as insurance. And you hope that Luciano is able to come through and be establish himself as a part of the team and a shortstop moving forward. But currently looking like they're going to have to go within the organization, but a lot can change in a year and certain guys could pop up. Marco Luciano could have a monster season and look really good at shortstop. And then that becomes clear. So currently it's very murky for what is the plan starting in 2024 at the shortstop position they also may end up targeting kind of a defensive specialist guy for the 2023 roster, someone who maybe has multiple years of club control remaining, and that guy could become perhaps the temporary solution at shortstop while they look to get a more impact prospect into that spot. I mean, Casey Schmidt played some short in the minors, so he could possibly, uh, last year in the minors, and he could possibly slide over there if needed. So, a lot of possibilities, but nothing clear at all. Anyway, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Locked On Giants your first listen every day. Now make your second listen Locked On MLB Prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Once again, my name's Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like the show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a lot. So thanks in advance and thanks to everyone who's done so already. Can't wait to be with you again tomorrow. Thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.